Retro Days. It's a Friday night in the late 1980s. All your homework is completed, or maybe it's still in your backpack awaiting a dire discovery on Sunday night. School is a distant memory, and you're looking for something fun to do with your friends. You already had a killer sleepover the weekend before school started, you've seen all the newest rentals, and you're bored with your NES games having played them all a million times. One perfect option remains, and really, it's more like a hundred options in one. Like a nesting doll of entertainment. Collect this week's allowance and put on your best denim jacket because you're about to take part in the ultimate 1980s mall experience. The idea of offering a collection of shops gathered in a single location goes farther back than the term mall reaches. In the 18th century, there were bazaars in the Middle East. Later, there were covered outdoor shopping centers like Passage du Quai in Paris and the Arcade in Providence, Rhode Island. Gathering a number of different sellers together in one place could even extend to things like farmers markets and flea markets. Even when the term shopping mall did finally make an appearance in the 1950s, they usually referred to outdoor shopping promenades rather than what we associate with malls contemporarily. It was only a matter of time though before someone saw the benefit of erecting a single building that could house dozens, if not hundreds, of individual shops. This architectural marvel was pioneered by Austrian-born Victor Gruen in 1956 when he built the 800,000 square foot Southdale Center in Edina, Minnesota. Though this was technically the first indoor mall, it wasn't the first to use the term mall in its name. That distinction goes to Paramus, New Jersey's Bergen Mall, which actually started out as an open-air center, only to finally be enclosed in 1973. Although there are other early examples of shopping malls during the 50s, 60s, and 70s, their true rise in popularity came in the 1980s with unparalleled growth, seeing more than 16,000 shopping centers built between 1980 and 1990. There was something exhilarating about the mall when we were kids. I say this because the shopping mall experience has changed considerably since the dawn of the internet. Malls still exist, though dead malls are certainly becoming more common, but I'm willing to bet you don't feel the same way you used to when you enter that air-conditioned behemoth of a shopping center. The automatic doors would slide open and you'd enter a fluorescent dream. Everything smelled new because, well, it was new. The tile floors of the main corridor, the paint on the walls, the glass display cases, it all shined. The store signs assaulted you with a staggering variety of choice, and if you had your wits about you, perhaps you'd step up to that center-mounted map and orient yourself for the night ahead. Your friends gathered around and each in turn pointed at a mandatory destination. But where to begin? Of course we're starting at the arcade. If you had extra coinage and you weren't in any kind of rush, the arcade was the place to be. Two of the most common mall arcades in the 80s were Aladdin's Castle and Time Out. Arguably the largest of the mall arcades, Aladdin's Castle had 450 locations at its peak. The popular destination was Jules Millman's brainchild. He had noticed how easy it was to make money with arcade cabinets, but at the time, many arcades were located in, to quote Millman, undesirable parts of the city. He got the idea to put an arcade in a retail location after a couple cabinets at his uncle's discount store started bringing in over a hundred bucks a week. This was just as malls were becoming incredibly popular and he eventually opened Carousel Time under the business name American Amusements. By the mid-70s, Bally bought out American Amusements and changed the name of the arcade to Aladdin's Castle, helping to bring a clean, family-friendly arcade to the masses. No matter which mall arcade you frequented though, there's no doubt you had your pick of a huge assortment of games, including pinball machines, skee-ball, and the latest and greatest arcade games around. Not everyone is a reader, but I'm willing to bet that when you were a preteen, you still had a passing interest in printed materials of some kind. Maybe you were strictly into magazines. Perhaps puzzle books were more your style. Better yet, why not a paperback copy of the newest Stephen King novel? How about your yearly Garfield or the Far Side calendar? All of this and more could be had at the mall bookstore. Like arcades, there were a couple possible bookstores in your 1980s mall. Two of the most popular were Walden Books and B. Dalton Bookseller. For some, these stores also functioned as stand-in for other shops, often selling board games, video games, comics, and movies. 
These bookstores were doorways to imagination. The same way movies and music transport us, a good book could do the same for those willing to take a chance. But don't read too long or else the cashier might tell you, with a little snark, this isn't a library. While Toys R Us might be synonymous with toy stores, KB was the reigning king of mall toy stores. In fact, by 1990, they literally began advertising themselves as the toy store in the mall. And who, boy howdy, did it deliver as the premier stop for any kid seeking action figures, video games, dolls, board games, and everything in between. And not only was the location a slam dunk, but KB had another winning strategy of heavily discounted products often featured right out front to draw in customers. The Kaufman Brothers, the name which eventually led to the eponymous K and B, started their business in 1922 as a candy wholesaler, eventually transitioning to toys in 1946. Retail sales didn't begin until the 70s, and by 1999, KB boasted 1,324 stores nationwide. Another popular destination for many kids of the 80s were stores that sold VHS tapes, like Suncoast Motion Picture Company, which was a rather late addition to malls in 1988. Some of us loved looking through the movies, but purchasing VHS tapes rather than renting was still an expensive hobby that not all parents were sold on yet, especially with the rise of video rental stores. Still, the prices of VHS tapes had come down considerably by 1988, and many more were starting to come around to the idea of building a home theater collection. A recurring theme with many of these mall stores is they rarely only sold items in their main category. Bookstores sold comics and video games, toy stores sold books, and Suncoast Motion Picture Company sold music and memorabilia. So even if you weren't in the market for the movie itself, you could buy the soundtrack, a t-shirt depicting the movie's logo, or even books about Hollywood. Sharing a similar space in entertainment media were various music stores. A few popular options were Sam Goody, Musicland, and Tower Records. And again, like other stores before them, they would often sell much more than just records and cassette tapes. Well, I am starting to get hungry and no trip to the mall was ever complete without a stop in the food court. The intermingling aromas of Chinese food, pizza, cookies, and deep fried everything wafted through the hallways, subliminally luring us to the vast array of delicacies. On hot summer days, perhaps the first of many choices would be the famous Orange Julius. The strangely frothy orange thirst quencher goes back as far as 1929, when Julius Freed's real estate broker, Willard Hamlin, took Freed's orange juice stand and reimagined the beverage by adding crushed ice, syrup, and a mystery powder which remains a trade secret to this day, which may or may not be egg white powder, but you didn't hear it from me. If you planned on continuing to walk the mall, maybe a hot dog on a stick was in order. The corn dogs and lemonades were good, but getting to laugh at the crazy pinstriped hats the workers wore was even better. If you had a mighty hunger only a meal could satiate, Panda Express might be a better option, and orange chicken sure would complement the orange Julius you already had. By the 80s, some malls had Sabaro, others had Pizza Hut, and others still had locally owned joints specific to the region. Whatever your mall housed, it probably had that specific food court pizza flavor, which wasn't exactly good, but not really bad either, just, you know, food court pizza. For dessert, you probably were grabbing a cookie from Mrs. Fields or Great American Cookie Company. Auntie Anne's, or Auntie Anne's, or Auntie Ann's? Anyway, Auntie Anne's didn't enter the mall market until 1989, but it's possible you had that option as well if you were really lucky. Look, no single trip to the mall could ever encompass every single store. It always seemed like you spent a little too much time at the arcade or trying to win prizes from those claw machines scattered throughout the hallways. There were still cosmetic stores like The Body Shop and electronic stores like Radio Shack, Circuit City, and The Wiz. Hold on, what about K Jewelers and the big department stores like Sears? There's no doubt we missed quite a few essential stops during this visit, but that's the great thing about the mall of the 80s. We can go back and visit any time we like, so long as we have a little bit of imagination and perhaps a new video from Retro Days to help us along. What were your favorite mall destinations? What were you eating in the food court? I would love to hear about it in the comments. And if you enjoy our content, please consider liking this video, subscribing to the channel, and maybe even activating that ubiquitous notification bell. It really does make a huge difference. Let's meet again next week to celebrate yesteryear right here on Retro Days. 
Clicky Clicky.